Our next speaker, instead of introducing him, we're going to do a little something different. Um, he's going to get up here and tell you a little bit about himself first and then begin his presentation. So we're going to get up for Steve Suits with his, <coughs> sorry, his presentation titled New Orleans Schools Four Years After Katrina. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Suits. I'm the Vice President of the Southern Education Foundation. Um, and instead of talking about uh, myself, I'd rather talk just briefly about the Southern Education Foundation so you'll know who we are. Uh, I think it's more important that you know us collectively than individually. We're the South's oldest public foundation, the nation's oldest education foundation. Uh, we have uh, deep experience in, um, since 1867 in trying to improve education in the South for all students. Most of our programs um, today, which I say is we have um, 19th century funds trying to deal with 21st century problems. Uh, making the case for fairness and excellence, improving teaching and student learning, helping black colleges, historically black colleges in the South thrive, and developing young leaders for the future. We've issued two reports on education after Katrina, and you saw those cover copies, copies of the cover on the, the first slide, and you... Um, if you'd like to get uh, copies of those afterwards, they are on our website at www.southerneducation.org. I think it's important for us to take a moment and think about where we've been in, and where students have been in the last four and a half years. Lest we forget in two, between 2005 and 2007, students who enrolled in the schools of this Orleans Parish went through an extraordinary, unprecedented experience, none for the better. 20 to 30,000 of those students did not attend a school in the school year of 05-06. And 10 to 15,000 of them missed all or most of the school year of 2006-2007. And they spread all around the country for those who did get into school, but primarily in other places of the South. Anyone who expected a chart other than this one for students who in fact had been displaced, either don't know the uh, nature of, of children or uh, doesn't know much of the literature about what causes students problems in schools. But as in the Houston schools in the, in the year for those students who were displaced there, uh, their scores were um, obviously abysmal. They had trauma and circumstances that they were dealing with. And it's true for students who went and were displaced into other schools across the South, Alabama, Louisiana, other parts of Louisiana, Georgia, Tennessee, Texas. It was a, um, it was a very difficult period even for those who were in school. And for those who returned in 2006, 2007, it was also a very difficult unimpressive year for those who look at test scores. In response to this unprecedented destruction of a urban school system, the federal government in the first part, of the first two years after Katrina, hardly even got close to helping to restore and recover the schools. 
Now, as you will see, Mississippi did, quite, did not get as much federal assistance at repairing the schools and the damages as did Louisiana. But they got a much more substantial percentage of their damage covered by the federal assistance. Now, some would say that that's because in, of the fact that uh, at that time, Mississippi had two very well connected United States senators, one being the majority uh, speaker, the, the majority of the, um, the majority leader of the Senate. But I will tell you that there are others who said that it was because the Mississippi schools were predominantly white and the Louisiana schools that were damaged were predominantly black. I don't try to divine the motive of policymakers. This one concerns Louisiana colleges, but I wanted to put it up because it's one of my favorite slides that I think captures how well our national government at that time decided it was going to meet the needs of its students in Louisiana. As of the summer of 2007, foreign governments had committed almost as much money as the United States government in trying to deal with the, the, the uh, fund, recovery funding for colleges in the state. There was a considerable resistance in Washington to, in, to funding for Louisiana to deal with the massive needs, including education recovery. And one of the reasons cited was that it would increase the deficit. It would increase the federal deficit. Well, if you looked at what the spending of the federal government was, what was spent for two, over two years was in fact one dollar on Katrina education recovery for every $2.5 billion the federal government spent on something else. That is not a deficit causing expenditure. It would not break the bank. It does not bust the budget. And of all the recovery funding that was spent in Mississippi and Louisiana, only 2% of it went towards restoring education over those first two years. I mentioned the, I review these because I think what is in terribly important to understand is that in this state and in this Orleans Parish, the funds that are necessary for success in recovering and reviving education remain both a national and a local and state issue. Our latest report last October I think made it perfectly clear that no matter what the governance locally, no matter what the curriculum, no matter what the teacher policy, the current course of schooling in New Orleans is unsustainable unless the federal government meets its obligation to restore basic infrastructure of education. Case in point, while the current superintendent of the recovery school system seems unusually optimistic, the fact is that the facilities plan, however it may be adjusted, will not be fulfilled. All the new schools will not be built unless the federal government comes up with another $1.4 billion. It will not happen unless perhaps a researcher sitting in the fourth row thinks that, that the state government might come up with it. <laughs> it's certainly not within the capacity of the local parish. 
the, the reasons why the federal government has not responded fully is a, is a, is, will be an important subject for, for research. But for the moment, it's a, it's a terribly important policy matter. And if you have relatives, if you have friends, if you have acquaintances, if you meet somebody on the interstate, you had best tell them that the New Orleans schools still need the federal government to come through. The president has put into the, has the current president has increased education assistance in the federal disaster relief program by 2%. He's doubled it to 4% instead of 2%. And he has put into the, uh, into FEMA's proposed budget for the next year, the necessary funds that, that can make a, a one-time commitment to rebuilding all of the infrastructure of the New Orleans schools. But if anyone has not been paying attention lately, uh, even if the president proposes it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's becoming law yet. So I, I want to stress with you that, that while there are lots of important local issues, and they go oftentimes as well to the State House, this is not no one's ambitions or vision for what New Orleans can be will happen unless the federal government makes whole on its obligations. And we've been spending a lot of time trying to see that that happens in Washington. And we will continue to spend some time on doing that. And I hope all of you will keep that in mind in your priorities and efforts as well. The Cowan Institute has, latest report has made an important um, point which, which we referred to in our report last year and I want to reiterate, which is that this system not only depends upon, in the short term, the federal government for infrastructure support. It also extraordinarily has depended upon the federal government's funding for operations and for recovery. If you were looking at a typical school district, the federal share of expenditures would be 10 to 12 percent. That's the typical school district receipt of federal expenditures. So there is also, uh, I think, a question of how the local schools are going to sustain its operations beyond the infrastructure at the rate it is now without continued increased federal role or increased local taxes. I didn't include the state. I want to turn now to looking a little at what's, uh, what, what's been going on in the schools from our perspective. I, I admit that I am not a resident. I am um, merely a sympathetic southerner. And perhaps a, a perspective from the outside, if not entirely useful in helping you guide where you want to go, can at least be uh, helpful in helping you um, uh, helping you make sure that, uh, that you've got all your bases covered. There's, the, the population is quite different in many respects, but one thing that isn't a great deal different is that since before and after Katrina, there is a substantial population that is extremely poor in this parish, extremely poor. Uh, the fact is that the margin of error of the surveys for the census mean that those are simply much the same all those years. And if you looked at children in uh, below 50% of poverty, it would show you a similar percentage, in fact, a little higher. As to the schools, I don't start with just looking at the public schools, certainly not in New Orleans, but you also have to look at the private schools. Uh, one of the charts that, um, that the Cowan Institute uh, put into its, uh, its first report on the schools, and we saw earlier uh, today, was a very useful one. 
I think it's uh, important to remember in that chart that you saw on public and private uh, schooling is that around 1950, there were about 40,000 white kids in the public schools. In 1954, Brown versus the Board was issued. In, eight, in 1980, there were less than 10,000 white kids in the public schools. This is an unusual parish because uh, there is about 37%, as of last year, 37% of the private school enrollment is black. I, don't th I haven't found a city uh, where that's true. In part, it's, it, it is uh, attributable to the long-standing and admirable dedication of the Catholic Church to the education of all children regardless of color. A Catholic priest I once knew, a white Catholic priest in Alabama I worked with in the 1960s uh, once said, uh, the, he was a lifetime southerner, he said, one of the great things about my church is if you, if you will sit in the, in the pew, we don't care what color you are, we'll let you go to our school. Now, with almost two out of five black children in the parish going to private, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it, there's about two out of five of all the children in the parish's private schools are black. But that only means that 17% of all black children are going to private schools. So that it's still less than one out of every five black child in the parish goes to a private school. 85% of the white students go to the private schools. Now these, this is 2008 data. Uh, the 2009 doesn't differ uh, is statistically in a significant way. And this is, this is pretty well what, uh, what resembled the uh, school system before Katrina. Uh, it's, a familiar, um, it's a familiar look. If you look at poverty, and it reflects to some extent race as, as it does in New Orleans. If you look at poverty, we broke down in our report not just charter schools, but which were selective admission. And not just regular schools, but which were selective admission. And what you see is a pattern here where selective admission on the basis of income and race are the terms by which schools and types of schools differ greatly from the system at large. There's not enough white children in the public schools of Orleans to, st to statistically distribute across all the schools. But that really is beside the point. About three out of four of all white students attend a selective admission school in the public school system. Three out of four. That is their price of admission. Almost half of all Asian students, 46%, attend only selective admission schools. While I appreciate the discussions about charter schools, and I think as it particularly relates to how to deal with costs, and as it particularly relates to how to assure better teaching, and as it particularly relates to what goes on in a classroom, it's an important discussion. But Gary Orfield's study has nothing to do with New Orleans. Nothing. 
What, ha what, is the, what in the public schools decides on the basis of race and income where a student will go is not a charter school. It is selective admission. It is being able for a school to decide on the basis of academics, which in the history of this system means a proxy for race and income, where a student will attend school. Since 1867, the Southern Education Foundation believes that that is fundamentally wrong. It was what gave us Brown, what gave us the conditions that Brown versus the Board of Education was attempting to overturn. As you can see from this slide, and I could have others to vouch for this one as well, performance as measured by test scores generally follow the pattern of what type of school, including especially whether it's a selective admission school. Obviously, the local school board, which created and sustained selective admission, has in its charters probably the best schools, the 20 best schools in the state. But who couldn't? I want to, I want, want to refer back to, the, and, I, and I do, do want to acknowledge, I think uh, the Cowan Institute is a, uh, is a unique resource. I don't know that there is any other institute data-driven so well that continues to try to help citizens figure out what's going on with their school system, and it is a unique resource for this community. And uh, while I, we and they may differ on interpretation, and that comes with the territory, the fact is that they are, are providing information I think that's quite reliable and very important for folks to look at. I was particularly interested in their November polling of citizens. The polling uh, methodology did not allow us to look at parents divided by race, but the public opinion surveys, which the Institute did, allows us to do that. And if you look at those returns, and they're available on their website, I call your attention to four questions which represent the major differences of opinion amongst black and white New Orleans, New Orleans. And that is these, and I, I see them as two about the past and two about the future. And these are the, the four questions on which there were at least 20 percentage points difference between a white answer and the black answers. The first was, are the schools better after Katrina than before? Now, I say that's about the past. There were 44% of the whites agreed and 24%, only 24% of the, the black respondents agreed. I say that's about the past because there are other questions about where are the schools today that where whites and black respondents generally agree. What I think the respondents are, are disagreeing about is the before part, that it somehow was so much worse back then. And you've had that discussion today and we'll continue about why people view that past through ideology or through experience or through their own position. And the second uh, one about the past was, did the state make the right decision to take over the schools? 80% of the white respondents said yes. 57% of the black respondents said yes. So it, this gets to, you can interpret these issues, th these answers, uh, any way you want. But I, w I put it in the historic context that uh, Dr. Johnson suggested, and it's this. It was not until 1965 
that this nation said that everybody, regardless of race, had, in fact, an executable, enforceable right to vote. And what in fact, in fact in the 1960s, when I began registering voters in, in the Black Belt of Alabama, many of the first voters were folks in their 70s who had never had a chance to vote in their lives. And when the state decides, a predominantly white state legislature decides to remove the powers of a predominantly black elected board. Doesn't matter what composition there are in the membership, but a, a black ele predominantly black elected board. You don't need a PhD in political science or black power or whatever to know that that means that those folks don't want their democratic rights to be taken away any more than anyone else's. And this issue of governance is probably one of the most difficult. The two future issues I think that the, the, the survey showed was one, there was a question that should a parent be able to send a child to any school? Only 37% of the white respondents agreed yes, strongly agreed. 60% of the black respondents agreed. And the second question, should schools raise, should the schools r receive more money to educate a student from a low-income family? Only 32% of the white respondents of Orleans said yes. 52% of the black respondents said yes. Those two issues, is my child able to go to any school that anyone else can go to? by open admission? And do we recognize that, that poverty means that children need more help, social support help, school help, than other children? Those are the fundamental issues on which this community remains, I believe, deeply divided by race and are ones that need to be resolved in the discussion about governance. To, re to elect a new school board by any method without a consensus on the basic issues of what this school should be, who it should serve, and by what right children get to go to one school and not another is the fundamental issue of all schooling and the fundamental issue of New Orleans. I think the fact is that you would, uh, there have been improvements of the whole school system, and that's what we look at primarily. We really aren't, the, the question of whether one school is doing better, um, it's, are, are generally all the students, especially those by socioeconomic groups, doing well? The fact is things have changed and improved uh, by test scores in the last couple of years, and that's good news. What it really says is that, that things are looking up. Not. Now, what you attribute that to is, a, is, is the question that has to get answered. You have to struggle with. Some people will, may claim it's because of the charter school movement, but there's no evidence of that, no persuasive evidence yet. It may be. But the fact is, it didn't begin only after the hurricane. This chart for the whole district of schools, public schools that were in New Orleans after, before and in New Orleans afterwards. Clearly the movement up for, since 2002 has been going on before and it's continued since. Same is true, generally speaking, for eighth grade progress as well. And this one shows the decline in the gap between New Orleans and Louisiana students. And in fact, if progress can be sustained, in this decade, New Orleans can have a school system that, is, that is, uh, it reaches at least the level of the state average student. Now, 
closing that achievement gap is a very important goal, and it should be data-driven, not driven by ideology, not driven by what one wishes to have but doesn't have the resources to have, but by the practicalities of what's good for the children. How we major interpret most of all of this data is this, and it goes back to the first presentation you heard today. I give most of the credit to the students. It couldn't be done without some important teaching, but every, if you read the literature, for example, the professional literature on student mobility and student in disruption, every one of those studies would tell you that after 2005, these students whose scores are closing the gap as a group would be much closer to where they were 10 years ago. And they would be dropping out of school in unprecedented numbers. Every bit of the literature so sh says that is what should be happening right now. And it's not. And that is worth celebrating. You can argue over why, but it really is worth celebrating. These kids have a resilience and a new sense of learning that I think we have to give them credit for. The graduation rates are well, not, not measured by the national standards, but measured by the number of students who in fact are leaving the 11th grade on to graduating are looking very good compared to what the national literature has told us to predict. So let me conclude this way. Here's unsolicited advice. I think that this system has to establish open admission for all schools. That is democracy. And what is the irony of our, the question of governance is this. It is not the state of Louisiana that has established a selective admission school. Every single selective admission school is the creature of the local school board, the locally elected school board. It may be a political compromise, but all of Southern history tells me it is not good education policy. Thirdly, I want to echo the earlier panelist on the importance of early childhood education in this city. The, 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 what, there are studies, and I refer you to some of our pre-K uh, studies and, that are on our website. The evidence in Louisiana and other southern states is too powerful to ignore. If kids can get into school ready, they will not fall behind. Thank you all for coming. We enjoyed your presence. You were a delight to see and a delightful audience. The, the pre-K pre is really, can be a very powerful tool for dealing with many of the problems that come in the latter years of schooling. Fourth, build on what's working now. I, I try to tell folks whether I'm in Atlanta or Raleigh or Austin or New Orleans that children are too important to be the victims of our own mindset. If you think about that, that's, uh, that's oftentimes how we rule our schools. Look to see what's working for kids. Do it school by school. Do it school type by school type. But build on what's working now. The arguments about the past and the future are only important if they do have a better future. And finally, revive a culturally rich city, its own culture of thinking for a living. One of, the, one of the real ironies of this city for me, looking over its, since its founding, one of the real ironies of, of a city whose, whose non-white population had higher levels of education
in the 17 and 1800s than almost any city um, in America is that by the 1980s and 90s, school children in huge percentages, 20, 25%, did not show up for school on the first day of school. They didn't show up the second. It took two weeks to get kids to show up in this city. That is not a culture that reflects this city's heritage. A culturally rich city culture means that whether you're talking about creating music that will be heard around the world or whether you're talking about creating neuroscience that everybody's envious of or whether you're talking about teaching in the elementary schools or the preschools, what you're talking about is thinking for a living. And this city has survived by that way and now it needs to make its way that way. Let me say this. I don't know whether this is the, the city that is going to be the great experiment for charter schools. It will have probably more charter schools than any other major urban area. But I don't think of it as an experiment in that way. It may be, in fact, a, a, a city that, uh, where the, the experiment about whether local control and state control can be married in some way, that has to be worked out. But that's not where I see its, uh, its, its, its real potential. What's the real potential? comes in what this city represents for the South and for America. We issued a report in the first of this year noting that for the first time in history, the South now has a majority of low-income students and a majority of students of color in the public schools. That's never been the case in, in, in the history of the United States or the South. This is a city that has an extraordinary majority of low-income students and students of color. How you figure out how to educate these children is not merely an imperative for doing the right thing. It's what has to happen if this city is to survive and thrive. It's what has to happen if the South is going to survive and thrive. 150 years ago, we could sustain an economy on undereducation. You can't sustain a wealthy economy in the United States simply because while there are service jobs that will always be there, you would be surprised how many low-income jobs can be performed by those eager in the third world. This city, this nation, this region will survive only if we meet the challenge, how do we educate excellently all children? And that means that equity and excellence are in fact the very same thing in the 21st century. That's our challenge. God bless all of you.